Good afternoon. We'll try this again. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. It's uh, my great pleasure to introduce um, Jeff Federspiel, who may be the first medical student who's ever given this conference. I'm not sure. Um, he is a Duke undergraduate graduate and uh, in health policy uh, and is now an MD-PhD at UNC and at the Billings School, uh, also in uh, public health policy, with a very strong grounding, I might add, in quantitative uh, statistics and biology, both in the undergraduate and graduate level. Uh, Jeff is um, an extremely talented individual who has uh, probably published um, as much or more than both most associate professors in the audience on his own, and this certainly knows what his way around a database. He'll, he's uh, worked with myself, Bimal, Trish, um, Barb Lytle, a number of you in the audience, uh, looking at stress testing after percutaneous coronary interventions, and we'll talk about this uh, today. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, Dr. Douglas, and thank you all for coming. I would like to start by thanking many of you in the audience today. Um, um, my ability to do this work here at DCRI has been, you know, essentially because of the help that you all have provided me, and I'm so grateful for that. In addition, I appreciate support from NIH and from ARC to support the research that we're going to present today. I probably don't need to mention this in this audience, but I think, in general, one of the most amazing achievements of the 20th century medicine is how successful it has been at reducing mortality due to heart disease and other uh, cardiovascular diseases. In 1970, you were three times more likely to die of a cardiovascular disease than cancer. In the modern era, those rates are essentially equal. And we've actually continued this trend really up to the present. The problem is, though, this costing more and more to deliver cardiovascular care. One of the big drivers of cost of care, at least recently, has been imaging. And I think it's certainly clear that we have made tremendous technological progress in what we can do non-invasively with cardiovascular imaging in the last 30 years. I mean, I mean just spectacular abilities to, to image the heart and other cardiovascular systems non-invasively. But that, that technological progress has come at a cost. In the first five years of the 21st century, Medicare spending on imaging doubled. And about a third of all imaging expenditures are for cardiovascular imaging. So it's a, it's a major policy problem. What can we do about it? Well, an easy solution is just to cut reimbursement. Um, certainly lowers expenditures, but it's an ex exquisitely blunt policy tool. It doesn't really differentiate between good use of imaging and bad use of imaging, or imaging which might improve outcomes versus imaging which would not. An alternative approach is some sort of, of directed targeting of care. And we can think about doing this through sort of payer mandates, things like uh, of RBMs, or as a professional uh, group through things like the appropriate use criteria or guidelines. But a limitation here, of course, is the quality of evidence we have available. I think in the most recent study, approximately 1% of all cardiac imaging guidelines are based on high quality evidence. Most of the rest is really just kind of expert consensus. Today I'm going to focus on stress testing, which I think probably everyone in the audience knows is a non-invasive way of detecting ischemia. This is one of the, of the most common forms of cardiovascular testing, and one that's grown substantially in recent years. Um, essentially one of the things which has doubled over the last 15 years or so. In order to gain evidence on the appropriate use of stress testing, ARC um, funded a project, which was PI'd by Dr. Douglas, looking at the use of stress testing after percutaneous coronary intervention. And so far, we've produced uh, several papers, one looking at descriptive patterns and predictors of stress testing after PCI that Dan Mudrick, a former fellow, did. One that BMOL is chairing, looking at associations between facility-level stress testing rates and clinical outcomes. And a third, looking at a newer technology um, called uh, coronary computed tomography angiography. Um, for my dissertation work, I extended this DECIDE project looking at some additional questions about stress testing. And the first was looking at these sort of patterns and predictors and outcomes in the elective PCI population. 
So some gaps in knowledge we felt about this topic were patterns of repeated stress testing after PCI. So there's been several studies looking at incidents of one stress test after PCI. But what about second and third stress tests? To what extent is stress testing governed by potential risk factors that might predict greater benefit from stress testing? And what is the impact of stress testing on clinical outcomes, particularly in a high risk population of patients? And all of these questions I think it's worth answering in clinically relevant subgroups, one of which might be elective PCI. So to do that, we took a population of patients receiving elective PCI, and we first answered the question, how often is stress testing used in this population? We next looked at how patient risk affects the use of stress testing. And we finished up by looking at a high risk subpopulation about associations between facility level rates of testing and clinical outcomes. This is a retrospective cohort study. We used two primary data sources. The first is the CAF PCI registry, which most of you are probably familiar with. This is a clinically rich data set collected at the time of PCI. We merged it to Medicare claims, inpatient, outpatient, and physician or carrier claims to give us longitudinal data about stress test use after PCI. I'll be showing you three studies today. This is a summary of the different data sources and designs. So this one is an elective PCI paper using CAF PCI inpatient and outpatient data and for PCIs performed between 2005 and 2008. For all of our analyses, we considered these four endpoints as being competing risks for stress testing. That is to say, we didn't count stress testing occurring after these events as a stress test. The intent with this design was to look at the use of stress testing in patients who had a clean clinical history after their PCI procedure. We also imposed a 60-day blackout period after PCI, which we didn't count any use of stress testing in this time window. The intent with this design decision was to focus on stress testing um, in the, in the post-MI period, which wasn't related to things like um, uh, rehab or stage procedures, those kind of considerations. So to answer the first question, we found that two years after PCI, the cumulative incidence of stress testing was almost 60%. And these are stress tests occurring in patients who didn't have a repeat revasc or an admission for MI or one of those events in between, being discharged in their PCI stay and, and their stress test. And when you look at the rate of stress testing over this time period, so kind of the, how many stress tests are being done at each point in time, you see a very clear periodic pattern in which there's notable peaks at 6 and 12 months after PCI. So we thought this is pretty indicative of stress testing being used for surveillance applications in asymptomatic patients. If you look after the first stress test at time to second stress test, you see sort of similar results that two years after their first stress test, roughly half of patients had had another. And again, a very strong periodic signal in which essentially stress tests happen exactly one year after a first stress test. To look at patient risk, we looked at a number of patient characteristics. And what we found was this sort of interesting paradox where for most clinical predictors, the cumulative incidence of stress testing was actually lower among the higher risk patients than among, than among the patients without the risk factor. So this sort of paradoxical pattern where lower risk patients were getting more testing. Finally, to look at associations with outcomes, we targeted patients who had a higher risk profile by looking at patients who had one of these five characteristics, having received PCI for an asymptomatic indication, having received an incomplete revascularization procedure, having diabetes, multivessel coronary disease, or history of prior MI. This gave us roughly 43,000 people. We calculated for each of these people, based on the facility in which they received PCI, the rate of stress test use at 15 months after PCI. And then we used these facility level rates 
to evaluate associations between the facility level rate of stress test use and clinical outcomes. One thing we find is there's broad facility level variation in stress test use, nearly threefold. And in addition, we see a difference in stress testing patterns in which in the lowest quartile stress test use, there's a relatively flat pattern of use over time. While in the fourth quartile, the highest quartile of stress test use, a much stronger periodic pattern to stress test use, suggesting more use of sort of surveillance testing. When we look at outcomes, and these are in adjusted models, we see no association between facility level quartile of stress test use in rates of death or MI, but a positive association with increasing use of repeat revascularization. So we would conclude from this that stress testing, both initial testing and repeat testing, is quite common after PCI. And that the patterns we see are really suggestive of very extensive surveillance testing. There's no evidence that stress testing is being employed preferentially in a targeted high-risk population. And even in a higher risk population, there's no association between stress test use and reduced mortality or reduced MI rates, perhaps in association with increased rate of repeat revascularization. For our second paper, in addition to being in working on um, when to use stress testing, we were also interested in what sort of stress test to use. There's obviously roughly five types of stress testing commonly employed in the United States. In this paper, we focused on two. The comparison of exercise echocardiography versus exercise nuclear imaging. Which, if you haven't seen them before, look like these. We showed in previous work that if you look using the NCDR at the use of these different modalities across the country, there is this very impressive large area variation in what type of imaging modality is used for exercise stress testing. Wherever we are here in the South Atlantic region, only 10% of stress tests are done with echo, whereas in the Pacific region, nearly a third are. So large variation in practice patterns regarding these two technologies. And we saw in unadjusted analyses that there were associations between choice of exercise imaging modality and short-term service use outcomes, things like whether they got more stress tests. Sorry, my planner's a little flaky today. Um, whether they had catheterization procedures, and whether they had a subsequent repeat revascularization procedure. So the fact that we saw large variations in practice patterns, and at least in unadjusted analyses, differences in service use, motivated us to look at whether this actually matters, whether the choice of imaging modality matters for outcomes. Um, we focused on the comparison of echo and nuclear imaging largely because our findings in that preliminary analysis showed that pharmacologic patients were a very different population. They were much older and sicker. And at least in the post-PCI population, ECG-only testing, imaging done with, or testing done without imaging, is really only done in the immediate post-PCI period, that the, the rate of it use drops off dramatically in the long term. So it's, it's clearly used for a different indication. So this comparison between echo and nuclear among people who were able to exercise was the cleanest comparison we were able to do. So our research question was, for patients who receive an exercise stress test with imaging, in this study we focused on a population who received PCI for an acute coronary syndrome indication. We wanted to know are there associations between imaging modality and clinical outcomes, other test use, and the total cost of their care, at least as proxied by total Medicare payments. For this analysis, we were restricted to claims only. We used a cohort, so we didn't have the, a registry. We were limited to a patient population that received PCI for acute coronary syndrome between 2003 and 2004. We used a propensity score method called inverse probability weighting to adjust for potential confounding. We looked at outcomes using Cox regression models, except for Medicare payments, which we did using a partitioned IPW approach, um, because you can't use Cox models for, for service use outcomes. We ended up with roughly 30,000 people. 
So again, to summarize for this study, we have claims but no registry. This is an ACS population treated in 2003 to 2004. Our propensity score model seemed to do a very good job of adjusting, at least for the, for the confounding factors we were able to adjust for. This is a plot of standardized differences. You can see the blue circles are before we adjusted and the red squares are after we adjusted. The dotted line is that 10% absolute standardized difference threshold that, that's been cited in the literature as being the appropriate measure of balance. And you can see that we're below that threshold for all of these, for all of these variables. If we look at the first 90 days, after adjustment, we see, and these are all comparing echo versus nuclear with hazard ratios, no association between choice of modality and rates of death or MI. But echo patients had lower rates of repeat revascularization and catheterization, but higher rates of repeat stress testing. After 90 days, no differences were significant. We looked at the total cost of care. After adjustment, um, the, there was a roughly $500 cost benefit associated with the use of echo versus nuclear imaging. This is almost entirely driven by the difference in reimbursement for the tests themselves, which was $491. And that within, after five months post-PCI, the cost difference between the two, two technologies was no longer significant. So we concluded that compared to nuclear imaging, echo was associated with lower short-term rates of kind of invasive cardiac procedures, but higher use of stress testing in the short term, no difference in mortality or MI, and lower short-term costs, but really driven by differences in reimbursements for the tests themselves. My final study, um, I guess it wasn't exactly truth in advertising, it's not an imaging study, it's more of a method study, looking at different ways of using instrumental variables to do comparative effectiveness research. I think most of the work we do is focused on adjusting for confounders using our available data. And we kind of do this point using one of two ways. We can either do standard regression models, where we try to break the association between an outcome and confounding factors in treatment by modeling outcome as a function of treatment and confounding factors. Or we can break it up here with a propensity score. Instrumental variables provide an alternative way of attempting to control for confounding. The idea being that if you can identify a factor which affects whether or not people receive treatment, but at least after adjusting for everything you can see in the data, it doesn't affect outcome through ways other than treatment, you can potentially produce unconfounded estimates of treatment effects, even if some of the things which affect treatment choice are unobserved in your data set, even if you do have kind of unmeasured or unmeasured confounding factors. The problem with IV, to give you an example though to start, is if you have an instrumental variable that has two values, zero and one, and if the IV equals one, people receive treatment A 80% of the time. And if the IV equals zero, people receive treatment A 40% of the time. Then you really have three populations, right? You have 40% of the people who are essentially always getting treatment A. You have 20% of the population that never gets treatment A. And you have this middle 40%, this marginal 40% that gets treatment A if the IV equals one, and doesn't get treatment A if the IV equals zero. That's the so-called marginal 40, the marginal population, which in this case is 40%. The problem with most forms of IV is that the effect estimate, we estimate when we do it, only applies to that marginal population. Now, in this case, that's 40% of the population, which may be valuable, but actually a lot of times in empirical applications, this may be 4% of the population. So you end up with this problem that you sort of, you've changed what's called the estimand. You've changed what you're estimating from the whole average treatment effect across the whole population. So this thing called the local average treatment effect, or the late, which only applies to this marginal population of people. The empirical example I'm going to use today is about drug-eluting coronary stents. Um, 
These are viewed as an improvement over the previous technology, bare metal stents, because they prevent scar tissue from forming and should reduce the rate of repeat procedures. They're relatively expensive. They're cheaper now, but at launch, they were roughly $2,500 each. It's fair to say they were probably the most rapidly adopted cardiovascular technology ever. They were adopted so rapidly that Medicare actually implemented a DRG to pay for them specifically before they were even approved, which I think was the first time that it ever happened. There have been a number of studies comparing drug eluding and bare metal stents, some of which you all have done here. Um, I think, in general, to summarize, if you do a randomized trial, you find that drug eluding stents don't affect rates of mortality, but do a pretty strong job of reducing rates of repeat revascularization. If you switch to a, doing a multivariate model, or propensity score approach, you tend to see that drug eluding stents reduce mortality by a pretty substantial degree, by as much as 25% relative risk reduction. And they're actually not so effective at reducing rates of repeat revascularization as what we've seen in the trials. With IV analyses, most have shown no difference in mortality, but a stronger reduction in repeat revascularization than was observed with a, with a propensity score analysis or with multivariate modeling. A number of people have done these. Um, we did one at UNC a couple years ago. And we show you know, unadjusted large mortality difference with drug eluting stents, modest reduction in repeat revascularization. When we use propensity score methods or outcome modeling, we, can, we, we change the mortality benefit to diminish it somewhat, but it's still there. Not much of a difference on repeat revascularization. When we switch to an IV model, there's, we see no difference in mortality and a stronger reduction in repeat revascularization. So, like I said, this has been done, it's not just by me, by many other people. Um, more or less consistent results. The problem is, though, that I told you earlier that these, this IV estimate is this thing called the late, right? It's only with these marginal people. And propensity score can estimate a number of different estimates, but at least when you're doing inverse probability weighting, it estimates the average treatment effect across the whole population. So, there's this sense in the literature that we're kind of doing an apples to oranges comparison, right? That we're comparing two fundamentally different quantities. So there's not much, you can't really say this is because one's better than the other. They could just be different valid estimates of different quantities. And it's not clear how to use the late in clinical practice because it's hard to identify these marginal populations in clinical, in clinical populations. Fortunately, um, economists have been working on this problem for a number of years and have come up with some clearer solutions on how we might address this. And essentially, we now understand a little better about um, how to address this problem using, uh, using statistical tools. So what we know is if, essentially, there's a three-question process that has to be worked out. The first is, is there heterogeneity in treatment effect? Do we think the treatment works differently in some patients than others? If not, then the treatment effect in the marginal population is going to be exactly the same as the treatment effect in the whole population, right? If it's the same quantity either way, it doesn't matter what population you estimate it in. So in that case, the average treatment effect will be the same as the local average treatment effect. And it doesn't matter really which method you use. Second, do patients and providers select treatment choices based on heterogeneity of treatment effect? So if treatments work better in some patients than others, but we have no idea who those patients are, it's as good as random, then again it doesn't matter because the population that's marginal, that marginal population, will have the same, will look the same as the overall population. So again, the late and the ATE will be the same. I think most of us though, think that patients, providers know something about who's going to respond well to treatment and who won't, and probably do select treatment based on that. So the third question is, do the things which affect whether or not patients get treatment, are they things that we as the analysts here with our registries can see in the data, or are they unobserved factors that we can't see in the data, things that the patients and providers may know, but we don't capture in CAF PCI or one of our registries or in claims data? If we capture all the factors, 
bivariate probit methods, which, um, which uh, Ying and Dr. Peterson used in a Jam paper a couple years ago, will actually estimate the average treatment effect. It's an established technique. It's been used for you know, 30 plus years now in economics, now seeing use in clinical literature. So we actually have a sort of a prepackaged approach which can actually estimate the average treatment effect with IV, even when we have this treatment selection choice. Now, if the things which affect treatment choice, we can't see in the data, if they're unobserved factors, bivariate probit won't work. This is a condition called essential heterogeneity. But an even newer technique, which is kind of still in development in the economic community, called local IV, can actually recover this average treatment effect, even when the factors which affect whether or not people get treatment are things which are unobserved in the data. So one thing we're working on is just a simple, simple uh, explanation of this in the literature to explain that, you know, this is when IV is the same as propensity score, this is when it's not, and here's how you can use different IV models to estimate the average treatment effect, even when you have these different circumstances. What I want to do today is illustrate these new methods to estimate ATE on a comparison of drug eluding and bare metal stents on four outcomes, all-cause mortality, MI, repeat revascularization, and bleeding-related readmission. For this study, we used cath PCI in inpatient claims. We couldn't use uh, outpatient or physician. We're going to study the whole population that was treated between 2006 and 2007. And the reason for that is the instrumental variable we're going to use is the facility variation in drug eluding stent use in the post-scare period. So for those who don't know, there was a safety scare about drug eluding stents in September of 2006. It was big news. It was on the nightly news. It was, it was a national thing that, pa that patients and providers were all tuned into. And what's interesting is during this year, this first year of the post-scare period, if you will, there was really broad facility variation in drug eluding stent use. So some facilities, the scare didn't seem to phase them at all. They proceeded to use drug eluding stents almost universally. While some facilities dropped back the drug eluding stent use dramatically. Um, for those who have done IV models before, uh, the first stage tests of instrument strength, and it's important to have a strong IV, otherwise it's not valid, were, were quite significant in this model. So we had a very strong IV for our analysis. The second issue is whether or not this is a good instrument, a valid instrument, if you will. What I've done here is collapse all the patient characteristics that we looked at into a single, to a single display. And what I've done is I fit a logistic regression of death at 15 months as a function of all those patient characteristics. And then I've calculated for the bare metal stent population and the drug eluting stent population Based on their observed characteristics, how many of them would we expected to have died at 15 months out? And what we see here is based on observed characteristics, bare metal stent patients had a 2.6% or two, excuse me, 2.8 percentage point higher likelihood of dying than drug eluding stent patients. This is pretty strong evidence that the two populations, there's, there's you know, quite strong confounding by indication, right? That, that bare metal patients are much health, are much sicker in the drug eluding stent patients. When I do the same kind of predictive estimation looking at facility variation, looking at place people who are treating facilities which were above the median rate of drug eluding stent uses versus below, we see much better balance. The patients are much more similar across rates of facility drug eluding stent use than they are based on just a comparison of drug eluding and bare metal stents. This isn't a perfect instrument. A perfect instrument would be one in which the graph on the right was perfectly horizontal. The populations were identical across the whole instrument. So we are relying on the data in cath pci to essentially clean the instrument as best as we can. But I would argue that the instrumental variable does seem to have, it seems to be a less, less strongly confounded situation than just comparing drug eluding and bare metal stents. And what we find is that with inverse probability weighting, we still see a significant difference in mortality, roughly a 3.6 percentage point reduction in mortality associated with drug eluding stent use. But when we use bivariate probit or local IV methods, that difference is eliminated. And the results are really quite similar between the two methodologies.
The difference in repeat revascularization between, IV, between propensity score and IV was not statistically significant. That being said, I would say argue is a clinically significant difference between two percentage points and four percentage points on a base rate of 13.5%, in which the IV model would predict a greater reduction in repeat revascularization than just an IPW model would demonstrate. We actually do see reduction in MI readmission, both with propensity score or with IV. And we see no difference in bleeding readmission. So we concluded that drug eluting stents are, in general, safe and effective in clinical practice, and that the differences in the results of propensity score analysis and IV analyses for drug eluting stent safety is not due to a difference between average treatment effects and local average treatment effects. It's due to a difference in, in other issues. And methodologically, um, one thing to point out is that bivariate probit is now available in SAS as a canned procedure. It's actually fairly straightforward to estimate now. The local IV methodology is still more in development. I have some R code if folks want to experiment with it. Um, but at least with bivariate probit, we are in an area in which this is a tractable solution to the problem. More work, though, is needed to understand how we can use IV optimally. And by that, I mean um, most of you are probably familiar with the work of Peter Austin, who's done just a tremendous job explaining how we can do propensity score in sort of a standardized, high-quality manner so that everyone knows what they should be looking for when they read a propensity score paper to know whether the covariates are balanced and that sort of thing and how the covariates should be selected. We haven't done that for IV yet. It needs to be done. We need to have a standardized approach to how we do IV modeling, which enables reviewers to immediately identify a high quality or low quality IV paper and can review them efficiently and we can have confidence in the results. So to wrap things up, um, I think study one really shows that, that the AUCs, which say that doing surveillance stress testing on patients without symptoms, we find evidence to support that, and that probably is a reasonable way of reducing utilization in a way which shouldn't harm patients. For study two, I think we need to do more studies. So one issue is the potential for heterogeneity of treatment effect. So some patients may benefit more from echo it may be very amenable to the type of imaging that ECHO provides, where some patients may be more clearly need a nuclear test. We couldn't really get that with our analysis. There's also this issue um, that economists worry about a lot, about productivity spillovers. And the idea is this. It's that if, um, if Dr. Douglas, who is an ECHO expert, if we tell her that she has to do nuclear all day, um, she probably... <laughs> So she, being an echo expert, probably delivers a better echo stress test than she does a, than a stress nuclear stress test. I think that's probably fair to say. And that patients benefit from her expertise in doing echo stress tests. So if we force her to do a nuclear stress test, patients may be harmed by essentially forcing people to work outside their specialty. And that the, the sort of global welfare implications of forcing all echo or all nuclear aren't exactly clear. I say study three, um, I would conclude that drug eluting stents are effective in reducing repeat revascularization, but at least when you do an IV analysis, do not appear to reduce mortality. For limitations, um, study one and two, or study one and three, uh, are both using facility variation. I don't call it an instrumental variable in study one, but essentially it's serving the same purpose as an instrumental variable. So you rely on this, the standard unknowable IV assumptions that it's, that it's a clean instrument and that sort of thing. For study two, um, having only claim data obviously is notable weakness. In terms of external validity, all of our studies are using Medicare patients, 65 and plus. Um, and certainly, that's a limitation. In addition, the patients who are getting PCI are changing with time the rates of PCI procedures are falling. So the patients who are getting PCI are actually sicker than they were when the data were collected. And in studies one and three, because we did a linked data set, um, one could argue that our study is limited to the population which actually was linkable. Um, that being said, um, um, studies have been done out of this group which have shown that the linked data set is actually quite generalizable to the population as a whole. So I think we should have reasonable confidence that at least for Medicare patients over the age of 65, our results are actually fairly generalizable.
for future work. I think um, Dr. Douglas is very excited because there's discussion about creating a stress test registry, which would enable us to get a um, sort of perspective, do analyses in which we collect data at the time of stress test instead of the time of, of PCI, which obviously would enable collection of a much more uh, clinically nuanced data set about stress testing itself. For methodology, I think one exciting area of future research is how we can better get at sort of individual specific treatment effects. So we can, fig can we figure out for the diabetic 70-year-old patient with heart failure in front of you, what's the effect of a treatment on them as opposed to just on the average person? There's work on this in the econ literature. It's not quite there yet. When we do bivariate probit, we make a very specific functional form assumption about the correlation in the two parts of the bivariate equation called joint normality. There are new methods being developed which will enable us to relax that and have a more flexible, less, less strong assumption there that we're working on. And like I said, I think in general, developing best practices for IV is a really, is a really important and uh, uh, promising area of future research. So stop there and take your questions. I appreciate you, appreciate you coming. off the questions is that on uh, by asking you uh, something you didn't uh, mention too much but was one of the most surprising pieces in the data was the use of stress testing in lower risk patients rather than high risk patients and I know you can't see into the brains of the people that are ordering stress tests but less stress testing in asymptomatic individuals at a PCI were asymptomatic in those uh, who were not diabetic less testing in diabetics and non-diabetics uh, post MI than not you might want to comment on that it's a hard question for me to answer, um, partially because I just don't have the clinical context um, to know sort of what's happening on the ground on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I think in general what our findings show is that the decision to, to undergo stress testing um, doesn't seem, at least in this sort of surveillance modality, does not seem to be driven by the things that we would think it might be reasonable to, to do that based on. Fair conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> and, and my hope, it's, I think it's a mother indication that there needs to be stronger guidelines and some stronger look at exactly what practices are for improvement. Certainly. Other questions, comments? Dan. Thanks. That, that was a great presentation and uh, some very impressive methodological um, work. Uh, I wonder about the clinical question that Pam's raised. Uh, this has been a subject we've obviously spent a lot of time looking at over many years. Uh, back since, you know, at the Duke database we had a set of studies that were done after the original PTCA balloon angioplasty work and we've been sort of wrestling with it ever since. Um, and we don't seem to be in a sense getting anywhere, um, meaning that we see the same problems, if you want to call them problems, the same patterns, and maybe we're just barking up the wrong tree. I mean, the, the clinician who's seeing a patient who's had an, a procedure obviously wants to do something, I mean, unless you posit that these are all malfeasant type of people who are just trying to enrich themselves by doing completely useless and unnecessary procedures. <laughs> uh, I think you missed the psychology of the situation, which is that the, that the doctors are being expected, the patient's expecting something with this checkup. Now, if you go home and the doctor didn't do anything, they didn't give you any new prescriptions, they didn't do any ex impressive tests, they just got out their stethoscope and listened to your heart, you're going to say, what the hell was that? You know, why did I have to drive two hours to come see this guy? Yeah. You know, that, that's bull. So, obviously, you do the stress test and it's maybe a little bit of a Wizard of Oz stuff, but that's like, you know, you had to, maybe you had to sweat a little bit you were worried for a while, and then you, they came and they patted you on the back, and they said, you know, I've got some good news, everything looks fine. And you've, you've had a much more enriching experience. Enriching experience. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now, maybe we need to find a different way to deliver that enriching experience, but I think since we haven't, 
it's not necessarily uh, pounding on people with different guidelines isn't necessarily going to, I mean, you may constrain them to the point where they can't do it, but the cost of doing, of building the constraint may be more than it's worth to do that, and maybe we're just not paying attention to the right signals here. So I have a little contextual knowledge in the fact that my uh, mother-in-law had a STEMI six years ago now. And she gets a stress echo every single year. And she gets it because they're going to find the MI before it happens next time and get it before it causes a heart attack. And there is nothing I can do to convince her of that of otherwise, right? Even though, I mean, I'm, I'm just a med student, but I'm pretty sure I'm on solid ground saying that's not the case, right? So I think to, to some degree, you're trying to undermine your grandmother's confidence in her doctor? <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? So, so on one hand, I, I, I agree that it provides reassurance. She is reassured by it. On the other hand, our findings, and, other, and you know, certainly ours aren't unique, show that patients are getting more procedures when you do this. So we are actually causing things to be done to them. Some of them will have complications. Um, so the, the, the net welfare effect of stress testing isn't actually that clear. Yes, there's this positive reassurance effect. But if we cause people to undergo things they don't need to undergo, that's a net, ne that's, or that's a negative. So what the net is, I'm not exactly clear. You need to ask your grandmother. <laughs> well, she hasn't, she hasn't had a positive test yet. That's good. Right. Just, um, just listening to this, it, it seems to me there should be compelling data to justify doing some of these tests. I see this when I do clinics sometimes. In fact, there was one yesterday where someone was recommended by another uh, cardiologist a ways away, but uh, to, who she's thinking of having a knee operation, and, and she's had several st uh, negative stress nuclears and a minor disease in the past, very minor, in one vessel. And... Um, it just seems, I mean, you can reassure a patient if you are comfortable and knowledgeable in what the current information and data shows. There may be equipoise. I mean, it just seems to me reassurance can be provided and should be provided through the uh, healthcare provider, an honest encounter with the patient with the best data available. And it, to do tests, unless there's a good reason to do it, it just seems to me that that's not appropriate way to practice. I think your point's well taken. You know, one of the, the that's one of the reasons I highlighted that that sort of discrepancy about the higher risk people. I mean, why is it more important to reassure a non-diabetic than a diabetic, or why is it more important to or less important to do surveillance testing on somebody who had a PCI but was asymptomatic before that, had silent ischemia, than somebody who had ischemia who kn you knew who had angina? who you know has a symptom that's going to give you a warning. Because um, it sort of all falls apart when you look at that data. It's not logical anymore. So yeah, I think this has been a great discussion. The, the world, Dan, I mean, while I'd agree absolutely that the, the rationale on both sides, having been in the clinics and having patients who've gotten this wonderful care by my uh, in practice, uh, pri private practice guy who's been giving them stress tests every six months or every year um, is so much better than me who unfortunately <laughs> tells them that they don't need this study now. But the realities are that the whole game will shift if our own government would get up the gumption to change the reimbursement system away from one that rewarded that private practice cardiologist for doing this testing. If we go to the system that now uh, under Bemo's leadership will either uh, fail or, or, or succeed, will we have now capitated care around or bundled payment around the PCI procedure itself. So if we use our drug eluting sense wisely in the right patients, we'll reduce repeat procedures and that will be a savings. If we use them, you know, without any regard and we use them in every patient in low risk as well, we'll end up losing money on that. If we go downstream and we look at this and we do stress testing in the people to pick up disease before they have recurrences, we'll win. If we don't and we use it indiscriminately in low-risk populations, we will end up losing our shirt. Um, so the game will shift. It's just a matter of when will our government get to this thing of doing this more broad scale than it currently is. <laughs>
you could argue that a 90-day um, episode of care would actually support using a bare metal stent because it's cheaper during the 90 days. And then <laughs> <laughs> that's cheaper within the first 90 days, and then you get the downstream testing because you have to test more because it's bare metal. So there's a lot of perverse incentives built into any model. And I think with, with, if you change from fever service to capitated, I think then the concern becomes, the incentive becomes to under-deliver care. So I think you still have these same issues. You still have to quantify quality measures and measure them because otherwise you can't. For years have claimed that we absolutely are not driven by the dollar. So that in, in a situation by which we are actually incented by every system to do too much, and we would potentially not care about money, we should, if anything, still treat the right way or over-treat as opposed to under. The only way we under-treat is if you're truly saying that physicians are absolutely driven by the dollar. Is that where we are? Well, I mean, not a physician, um, but, I but, I, but I think Beemel's and, and your paper in JAMA showing that if you own your own stress testing device, you use a lot more of it is pretty compelling that at least on some margin, we are indeed motivated by money. <laughs> the, the thing is a, a more complicated, I think. Uh, people tend to reduce it to sort of a, a simple thing that doctors are driven by reimbursement. And, and in truth, it's a very multivariable equation with a lot of influences, of which that's one. It's clearly a demonstrable effect. But I think um, William Zogby actually wrote an editorial a few months ago, which he made me read as condition of uh, some writing thing that I was involved in, and, and uh, made the argument that we've really developed an imaging culture. And in a sense, that we've built what used to be some people call defensive medicine, others may call this reassurance practice uh, that you know, also puts a few dollars in my pocket, um, is now so deeply ingrained to, into our thinking in most of the cases that we can't envision delivering good care without it. Now, it varies as to exactly what that cultural view looks like in different settings. But, but I think it's, it's a much more complicated problem. And as you say, the, trying to use the reimbursement system to manipulate that cultural set of beliefs is not an easy task. In fact, nobody's managed to do it well in the last 50 years. So uh, we should be a little bit cautious about expecting it to happen in the future. But I wanted to actually ask you a different question, which was about the local instrumental variables yeah. and your claim that you could actually uh, account for an unobserved, unmeasured confounder using mathematics. And I'm just curious if you can explain how that's possible to do. Yeah. So you do it, in short, by imposing a tremendously strong parametric assumption about the correlation between measured and unmeasured. So this goes back. Are you familiar with, with uh, Heckman's selection models and that sort of thing? So, so Jim Heckman, who um, is an economist in Chicago, essentially has built these models where if you make very specific functional form assumptions about um, how the measured and unmeasured confounding is related, the distribution of unmeasured confounding in the population, then you can indeed identify the effect. I'm happy to send you a paper if you want to see kind of how that derivation works. But um, the downside, of course, is that you have to make these heavy assumptions, right, about the functional form and that sort of thing. Um, in this case, it didn't matter because we didn't seem to, we didn't sh find any evidence of this unmeasured selection. We did the, the test that Heckman prescribes, um, but I certainly agree, um, having done some local IV, that we need much more work to identify how well this technique works in real, real empirical data. Well, and how often those that strong assumption is actually likely to be true? Exactly, and it works great in Monte Carlo studies because you simulate, you make the data look like the the model, right? But how it actually works in, empir in real empirical data, that's an intense area for future research. But that being said, you know, it only came out 10 years ago. And I think by very appropriate, it came out in the 70s, and we're just now seeing it in the clinical literature. So we're still, we're still 20 years away from that being routine use in, in clinical literature. So. Wonderful. Thank you. A very great discussion and a wonderful talk, Jeff.